that Christmas carol. We're going to be in 1 Peter again this morning. 1 Peter 4. <clears throat> and we've been focused on these last a couple weeks on these verses of verse 10 and 11. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Remember, we looked at verse 10 for a couple weeks. As every man hath received the gift. So we saw the reception of the gift. First of all, the reception of the gift of salvation in Christ Jesus. And you can't have the gift to be able to serve and minister to one another unless you have the gift of salvation. So if you're here today and you've not yet received the gift of salvation, then all that comes after that, the gifts of the Spirit in your life, are non-existent. You have to have the Holy Spirit in your life. You have to have the Holy Spirit taking up residence within you in order for you to have a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts come from the Holy Spirit. And so we want you to have that. The Lord wants you to have that. But you have to come to the point where you bow the knee before the Lord Jesus Christ and Say, I repent of my sin, I turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for my soul's salvation. And on that day, you can be born again. At that moment, you can be born again, made alive by the Spirit of God. Quickened is the Bible word, quickened by the Spirit of God. And then you'll have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, and he will impart to you a spiritual gift beyond your salvation. Your salvation is the greatest gift God gave his only begotten Son so that we could have salvation. Salvation from hell, salvation from eternal death salvation from sin, but then God also gave gifts to men, and God gave the gift, a gift for service for him as we are here on this earth, and spiritual gifts that enable us to have the recognition that God is working through me, and that's a great blessing. Many people in this world, especially at Christmas time, long for some type of purpose in their lives. Perhaps things have failed that they thought would be successful, and they thought, well, I'm going to have a great Christmas season, I'm going to have a great time with friends and family. We're just going to have, it's going to be a time of joy. And all of these things are promised by the Christmas carols and by the signage that's around and all these things. And then they get in a fight with somebody. Or then they find that finances aren't what they thought they were going to be. Or then they find that sudden, some calamity has come in their life, whether a physical problem or a financial problem. And now all of a sudden that which was promising goodness and promising greatness in their lives is destroyed. And so they're distraught. And so they're hopeless because they feel like life has no meaning and life has no value. But God does provide value to us. He provides meaning to our lives. And then even if those things are negative in our lives, I have the understanding that I am being used by the God of heaven. My life has purpose. It has meaning. It has value. God has intentions for me and for my life. And if I'm willing to submit to him, then I can use my spiritual gift in his service. And I can recognize that he's using me. And it's a great, uh, it's a great knowledge of fellowship with the Lord, Amen. our creator. And this is what we're searching for. This is the knowledge that we all hope to have. So as every man hath received the gift in verse 10, the reception of the gift, also the reciprocation of the gift, even so minister the same one to another. So the same gift that God has given to us, if we've trusted in Jesus Christ, we ought to be using that to serve one another, to minister to one another in God's church. Reciprocation, then also the responsibility as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Some people have trusted Christ. They have been born again. They do have the Spirit of God within them. Therefore, they have a spiritual gift, but they are not good stewards of the manifold grace of God. They are bad stewards of God's grace. And they've taken the gifts that God has given to them, and they've squandered them like the prodigal son. They've taken the wonderful things that God has brought into their life, and they're wasting them, because they're not using their gift in God's church. They're not using their gift in God's service. They are bad stewards of the manifold grace of God. God wants us to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What does a good steward do? A good steward takes the things that were entrusted to him, and he uses them profitably and for profitability. He takes the talents that God has given to them, and he yields more talents with them. He takes the finances that God has given him, and he uses it for God's service. He uses the uh, opportunity to minister to someone in service, and he uses it for God's service. That's now productive. 
It's now profitable. It's fruitful in God's service. That's what a good steward does. If you have a job and your job is to manage some area of the business, whether it be keeping something clean or whether it be managing somebody's account or whether it be stocking something or whether it be working on some part, you are a steward in that job. And if you do not fulfill your job and do a a good job at that job, what does your employer do? He fires you. Or he calls you in the office and he says, uh, you're not doing such and such right. You're not up to standard here. You're not up to par. You need to be caught up in these areas. Or your job is at stake because you're being a bad steward. A bad steward. God wants us to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And those were the points from verse 10. But we're in verse 11 now. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. <clears throat> we remember from last week, the ministries. From Romans chapter 12, there are seven spiritual gifts that God has given. Seven differing spiritual gifts that God has given. And they kind of fall into one of two categories, either speaking gifts or service gifts, generally speaking, although there's some crossover there. And so he uses those two ideas, those two categories kind of, as a demonstration of God's working through us. And he says in verse 11, if any man speak, there is the speaking gifts, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. So you have speaking and you have ministering there, two sides of the same coin, spiritual gifts, their service gifts, and their speaking gifts. And we don't want to overemphasize the individual gifts. We recognize them. We uh, nurture them in our lives. But we don't want to overemphasize them either because then we become proud. And then we also can become judgmental of other people saying, well, they have this gift and we can say, well, they're going to respond in this way or they're going to do this this way. And we start to have a, a rift between people be all about spiritual gifts, which are to be a blessing and edification. So we want to minimize the gift generally and emphasize it personally in our lives. And most of all, emphasize the manner in which we apply these things, as he says in 1 Corinthians 12, yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And the way is the way of love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So we have the ministries that God has given, but we also have the manner in which God wants us to employ them. He says, let him speak as the oracles of God. So whether we're speaking or a serv service gift, we should recognize we are the messengers of Almighty God. When I serve you in God's church, I'm doing it as if God is serving you. I'm doing it to be a blessing to you because God wants to bless you. That needs to be my motivation, and it needs to be your motivation for each one of the people in the church and for God's church as a whole. When I do this, I'm doing it because God wants to bless his church, and God wants to bless his church through me. And so when I do it that way, then I am doing it as of the oracles of God or the word of God, the direct message of God, which is what an oracle was. Do it as if the Lord was doing it himself. My outstretched arms to you, or my encouraging word to you should be just as if God is speaking those th things to you. Say, well, did you receive some subliminal message and your antenna go up and you hear some message from God? No, that's not the point. He says, as of the oracles of God, as if God was speaking to you or as if God was the one who was helping you with that task. This is the way God would have us be. The oracles of God, as of the oracles of God. And how are we doing these things? Are we doing them according to God's will? Or are we doing them in another way, and that's what we want to look at this morning, is number three, we saw, first of all, the ministries of verse 11, if any man speak and if any man minister, we saw the manner as of the oracles of God, but now, this morning, we want to see two things, we want to see the means, because he says they're as of the ability which God giveth, and we see the, want to see the motivation, that God and all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever, amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your word. <clears throat> I pray that you use it in our hearts as we come to it this morning. And we pray that the Spirit of God will put uh, the pressure on different areas of our life that need to change. And it will be a comfort and encouragement to areas of life where we're doing right. And I pray, Lord, that you guide us and direct us this morning. We do want to pray for those who I forgot to mention earlier, Lord. I think of Brother Josh and Brother Jim, both who are undergoing physical trials at the moment. Lord, we pray that you strengthen them today. And we thank you for how you brought them along in their lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I did want to give you an update. Brother Josh, I talked to him uh, Friday, and he was doing somewhat better. So we praise God for that. And then Brother Jim also had a procedure. And as I understand it, he's doing well from that. So we're continuing to pray for these men that God will raise them up uh, as we go forward.
Oh, and another thing I forgot to mention is that we have dinner on the grounds today. Man, I'm just forgetting everything today. Uh, uh, what a weird time for it to pop into my mind. But uh, I think I smelled something maybe. That's what, uh, that, that's, what, that's what brought it up. So thank you, Nancy and ladies, for providing that. But we will have dinner on the grounds today. If you're visiting with us, please stay with us and join. Right after the message this morning, we'll be able to have a time of fellowship and food together. It'll be a blessing. And then the afternoon service after that. But we want to look this, this morning at our service for the Lord. We have the ministries, verse 10. We have the manner, as of the, uh, excuse me, verse 11, speaking and ministering. We have the manner, let them do it as of the, let them speak as of the oracles of God. But we have the means, let them do it as of the ability which God giveth. So in our service for the Lord and his church and with the spiritual gift that he's given to us, we should be recognizing that it comes from the ability of God. We like to glorify our own abilities, don't we? It starts as children. We begin with the young people. We tell them, and they just sung, and we tell them, what a great job you did, don't we? And we, they want to hear that, and we want them to hear that. We want to encourage them. But we tend to sometimes go throughout our lives looking for that type of affirmation. And uh, when I preach, uh, my, my flesh wants to hear you say, that was the best message I've ever heard in my entire life. It has completely changed my life, and uh, I'm never going to be the same, and you are just a wonderful that's what my flesh wants to hear. Don't, please don't do that. It'll be really awkward for everybody if you do that, okay? But you understand, I'm, I'm making a point here, that we desire this affirmation all the time. Uh, until the day we die, we desire this kind of affirmation in our flesh because we want ourselves to be made great. We want to feel that we've done a wonderful job in and of ourselves, but that's not the way that spiritual gifts work. God says, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. God gives us the strength to do these things. That's the word for ability there is the Greek word iskus, and it means strength. God gives us the strength. God provided the, the strength to do those things. You are to be serving with God's ability. Back in Romans chapter 12, and I, you don't have to turn there, but I'll just look at it and so I quote it right. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, <clears throat> he says, uh, speaking of spiritual gifts, he says, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, accurately. We need to recognize ourselves for what we really are. We're weak. We're frail. We have no strength. But to think soberly, now get this, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. He's talking about spiritual gifts. God hath dealt to every man the measure. So where did you get your spiritual gift from? Is it because you're such a great person? Is it because you have great abilities by yourself that you somehow imagined and brought upon yourself? No. God hath dealt these to every man. God hath given them to every man. And that verse provides confidence for us because God has given us something, but it requires humility of us. It requires dependence from us because God hath dealt to every man. We need to think soberly and accurately about ourselves and not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. The word dealt there is the Greek word merizo. It means to divide. God has doled out these things. He's divided some for here and some for here. And uh, we look at these things and we see, well, this person's ministry is so vast. So what? God dealt that out. We didn't deal that out. It wasn't doled out because there were some wonderful person. God dealt that out. Uh, we look at a, a, the impact of someone's spiritual gift. I, I have the gift of prophecy, I believe. And I look, look around and I see somebody who can preach way better than me. And I say, wow. If I could preach like that, you know, why is it that God gave them a better dose of the gift of prophecy than he gave me? I don't know. But that's not my concern. God hath dealt to every man according to his will, according to his purposes, because the spiritual gift is not for me. It's for his body. It's for Christ's body. God hath dealt to every man. The word measure there, God, God hath dealt to every man. The measure of faith is metron, and it basically has the idea of the measuring cup that you ladies use in your baking, which I hope you do a lot of during the Christmas season. Uh, what is, we like pumpkin pie, okay? We got, had that Thanksgiving. We can carry that right through a Christmas season. <laughs> my wife makes my absolute favorite dessert ever. She started making it maybe a year, two years ago. It's called Cranberry Christmas Cake. And you will not find a better dessert while you hear from cradle to the grave. Uh, this is it. This is the summit of all desserts. It's just wonderful. And, uh, uh, I love it when she makes it, and I eat most of it when she does. It's not good for me, so she doesn't make it too often. 
uh, it's, it's just a great blessing. But you use measuring cups to de decide what you need to put in these things. Uh, you have to measure out how much sugar and how many cranberries and how much flour and how many eggs, all this stuff, you have to measure it out. And you don't want to put in too much or too little, right? Now, do we trust the Lord that he put in the right amount? The Lord puts the right amount in us. He gives us the right measure. And we should remember, because God has dealt, these, dealt us these things, that we have a great confidence in doing his work. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notice, Christ which strengtheneth me. Let him do it as of the ability that God giveth, or the strength that God giveth. So I can do this. If God gave me this ministry, God gave me this opportunity, God gave me this in his will, not something I've dreamt up or drummed up, but something that he has for me to do, I can do it. I have a great confidence in that. I like that. I re read my kids uh, some uh, stories every now and then from this uh, series of books that my mother used to have when I was a kid called uh, Uncle Arthur's Bedtime Stories. You ever heard of that? Okay. No? Okay. I'm weird. All right. Uh, there's a story in there called Knocking Out the Tea. Knocking out the tea. Because that's what we, we're, we're so quick to say, I can't. It can't be done. I can't do it. But knock out the tea. With the Lord, with the strength of the Lord, it can be done. And I can do it. But it's difficult for me to do that because uh, this trauma has happened in my life or these are the things that I've struggled. No. It can be done. And if I keep the can't there, the can't will stay, the keep the tea there, the, it will stay as can't. And you always be in can't mode. With the strength of Christ, knock out the tea. And then it can be done. You know that's that, uh, that uh, uh, old song, God, any rivers you think are uncrossable? God, any mountains you can't tunnel through? Tunnel, tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. He does the things no one else can do. And that's the truth. You know where that came from? That was the... Uh, that was the, it was not those words, but it was a similar, it was from the Panama Canal. They had a slogan that they would repeat over and over. They said, you got any mountains you, or got any rivers you think are uncrossable, mountains you can't tunnel through? We specialize in things thought impossible. We do the things no one else can do. And this lady, Bessie, I believe her name was, came along and rewrote it and wrote it for uh, God's people. Said, no, God specializes in things thought impossible. Because we're going to come to a place where we can't. Uh, and if they were really thought about it, they wouldn't have said that about the Panama Canal. I think, uh, I think I've heard an estimate, double-digit thousands of men died building the Pan Panama Canal. So you know what that tells me? They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Humanity is weak. We can only go so far. And when it comes to operating spiritually in Christ church, we can't go an inch without the strength of Christ. We might think we are, but we're not going anywhere without the strength of Christ. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not in our might, in the power of his might. We should recognize that the means of our operating in the Lord also include God's opportunity. God's opportunity. So remember, we asked that question, God, what is your will for me to do at this time? At this moment, what is your will? Sometimes we like to create our own opportunities. I want to have this great thing. I want to be known for this. I want to do this service. And we create our own opportunities, but that's not what God has for us to do. Take the opportunities that God provides to us. It's in God's opportunity. It's according to the ability that God giveth, as our text says. If you'd hold your place there in 1 Peter 4 and go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Okay, diversities of gifts, different gifts, but the same spirit, differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Administrations there is the word for ministries. So there's different ministries, there's different opportunities, and diversities of operations or energies, operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. So God gives different gifts, he gives different service opportunities, and he gives you the ability to do them in different ways. All thing, the, the, everything's different, right? Nothing's the same. But the Lord is the same. God created these things. The same Lord created that ministry as the same Lord who created that gift who provides the energy to accomplish it. The same Lord. Let's not try to create our own opportunities of service. Let's trust the Lord. Look at, again, verse 14 of the same chapter. 
for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? So, well, what if it's an opportunity that I don't enjoy? Or what if somebody else has something that I want to do? Or what if I don't think my opportunity is that valuable? Uh, because we get trapped in this attitude. Well, I'm not doing what I think I ought to be doing. I'm, my great talents are being misused. Well, that, that's a funny statement to make when we're thinking soberly, when we're not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Look at what he says. If the ear shall say, because I am not of the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Does the eye have the opportunity to just say, I'm out? I hope not. I don't want to see your eyeball rolling down the aisle. That'd be a sight. There's a little pun there for you. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? See, everything's necessary, even that which you think is not necessary. If you're doing it even, it's still necessary. But now are they many members, yet one body? The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more of those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. See, this is what it, when we are focusing on using God's gifts by God's strength and according to God's means, all of a sudden we have the same care for one another. And instead of pulling apart, schism, that's what it means, a tear. Instead of tears, we're healing. Instead of being segmented off, we're one whole, as God's will is for his church to be unified. This is what God desires for us. Back in Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But then if you come down to verse 4, he says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having get then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, God's grace given to us, God's gifts given to us, God's strength given to us, to do these things. Go over to the book of uh, Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1. And he says in verse 23, If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. By the way, the, the, the church is Christ's body. There's no universal church. When we get saved, we're not put into some universal church. Christ's body is this right here. Uh, it's what does Christ's work. It's where Christ is magnified. It's where Christ is resident, where Christ is dwelling. It's his body. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to, to fulfill the word of God. So Paul had a ministry that God gave him. It wasn't in his own strength that he accomplished that ministry. It was in the strength of the Lord. It was God's strength. Look at verse 29. He details what his ministry was. And then in verse 29, he says, whereunto... To the ministry that God gave me, I also labor. Sometimes God's ministry is labor. It's work. It's difficult. It's arduous. Paul's ministry was arduous. It was not pleasant. But he says, what do I do? I labor, striving according to his working. Not my own working. His working, which worketh in me mightily, God's strength, is what works in us to do his will. And that's what we need to rely on, God's strength. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, verse 3. For ye are yet carnal, these who were emphasizing their own 
strength of spiritual gifts. Verse 3, you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So, notice what Paul says. Let's not glory in what I can do, or what Apollos can do, or what some other man can do. Let's not glory in those things. He says, who then are these people? And we should say that about ourselves. Who then am I? Who then am I? If Paul could say this about himself, who then is Paul, then I say about myself, who then am I? I'm nothing. Neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth anything, but God that giveth the increase. God gives the increase. God gives the strength to accomplish these things. Let him do it according to the ability, as of the ability which God giveth. As of the ability which God giveth. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. The means of practicing our spiritual gift in the church, but also the motivation. The motivation. Because look back at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. He gives us, uh, gives us the ministries, speak, minister. He gives us the manner as of the oracles of God. He gives us the means as of the ability which God giveth. But he gives us the great motivation that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And this last point could be first, the motivation for serving the Lord in his church. This could be the first point, because if we get this wrong, all that goes before it is going to be wrong. But if we get this right, it's going to be a lot easier to get everything else right. Am I doing it for God's glory or for my own glory or for just something to accomplish? But am I doing it for the right purpose? Do I have the right motivation in serving the Lord? My service for the Lord needs to be to the glory of God through Jesus Christ. I'm serving God. I want to glorify God through Christ's body here on this earth. And I, as I have Christ in me, the hope of glory, I want to be doing Christ's work in Christ's way for God's glory. To the glory of God through Jesus Christ. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to who be praise and dominion forever and ever. The Lord Jesus is the only one who deserves the praise eternally. The Father deserves the praise through the Son eternally. Ministry in Christ's body is not about you. It's not. We say this to our children, and you probably had it said to you, the world does not revolve around you. And that's the truth. It doesn't revolve around us, and certainly God's will does not revolve around us. And some people say, well, if the church has this ministry or that ministry for me, then I'll come. If I can do this in the church, then I'll go to that church. Some people try to go around to different churches and they bring their ministry with them. You know, uh, well, I'm going to leave that church and therefore this ministry is no longer existent here. It's, it, I'm, I'm bringing it over here. If the church has this ministry or that ministry for me to be in, then I'll go. Then I'll come. Uh, well, if I have to follow that dress code, I'll not be involved. I don't, you're not, you're not going to tell me what I have to wear to be involved. I don't want to wear that. I don't want to do that. Uh, what, a, what a terrible attitude to have. And you're doing it for yourself. You're ministering for yourself. You're not ministering for Christ. If you're ministering for Christ, then those things don't matter as much to you. you know, come, here, come here January or February, we're going to have a ministry Sunday where we focus and, and, and reveal again and return to why we're doing what we're doing, what we're doing, and then how we're doing it. And we'll address some of these things. Uh, I'm just protecting my own comfort then. What, if I have to rub so shoulders with that person in the ministry, then I don't want to be involved in it. Oh, they're, they're involved there? I don't want to be involved. Well, that's terrible. That's protecting my own feelings. That's, a, a, that, that's that divisive attitude that we saw in 1 Corinthians 3. Well, if I can't do it this way, the way that I want to do it, then I'll not be involved. I want to do this ministry this way, and you're telling me I have to do it this way. Well, and you're just leaning on your own agenda. You're not leaning on the Lord's strength and you're not doing it for the Lord's glory. You're doing it because you want to do it and you want to do it your way. Well, if I can't control how this is done or I can't control the outcome I'd like to see, then I'm not going to be involved. We have a lot of Christian control freaks who we've decided if I can't do it this way and if it doesn't get done to my uh, liking, then it's not worth for me to be involved in. Some people 
say, well, if I can't do it as much as I want to, I'm restricted in the amount of opportunity that I have or in the areas of service that I have, then I'm not going to be involved. I'm not going to do that because they're focused on their own self-image. Some people have the attitude, if this ministry doesn't have me in the view of others, then I'm not really interested in that. If this doesn't put me in the light, then I'm not really interested in that. I'm not really interested in serving the Lord unless everybody knows what I'm doing. I'm not really interested in serving the Lord unless I'm in my comfort zone. All of these things come into play. Turn over to John 3. Look at John 3. Here's a great testimony for us from the, the uh, First Baptist. John 3. Verse 25, <clears throat> there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, that's Jesus. Remember, Jesus was the forerunner, or excuse me, John was the, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was the forerunner, and he bore witness of the light that was to come. And they said, you bore witness of him. That one that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same Jesus baptizeth, and all men come to him. See, they were a little concerned. They said, John, you had this great following before Jesus showed up. Now Jesus showed up, and you bore him witness, and you said kind things about him, and you said, uh, I'm not worthy to unlatch his shoes, but now you know what he's doing? He's drawing away more disciples than you. And all men follow him. And our group is shrinking here. And we had this great following, and now it's disappearing. Isn't that bad? What are you going to do about this, John? John answered, verse 27, and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Well, that goes with our last point, the means. I only had what God gave me for the time that he gave it to me for. I was just doing his will for that time. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. You know what? Often Christian people have this attitude. We, wouldn't never, we would never say this. It'd be blasphemous. But we have this attitude, I am Christ. We have this attitude that I can be the one to lead everybody. I'm the one that's important here, not everybody else. And John had to say, listen, I told you I wasn't the Christ. I never acted like the Christ. I never said I was the Christ. I never gave you any confusion that I was the person to follow. I told you I was only pointing you to him. Isn't that what our job as God's people is? We should remind ourselves all the time and remind others, no, I am not the Christ. My job is only to direct you to him. My job is only to glorify him. My job is to demonstrate Christ in me, but not to be him. I am not him. I'm bearing witness of him. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bridegroom is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, or excuse me, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. See, it's like we're at the wedding and we're mad that we're not the bridegroom. We're at the wedding and we're mad we're not. How many of you ever gone to the wedding and you were like, man, I'm just so unhappy that I'm here. That bridegroom is, uh, is the one getting married and I am so angry at him because he's the bridegroom. And I wish him nothing but the worst because he's the bridegroom because he's getting married on this day. Have you ever had that attitude? No. You go and you say, I wish you nothing but the best and all these kind things, you know, and uh, all, because that's sincerely how you feel. It's a time of happiness, a time of joy. Your friend is getting married. You're happy for him. You're not angry at him. Maybe you are because he won't spend as much time with you. Uh, you're not angry at him. You're happy for him. And John the Baptist said, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. The bridegroom's here now. I'm happy that he's here. I rejoice because I hear the sound of his voice. This, therefore, my joy is fulfilled. This, what I, this is what I was hoping for. So when our ministry is diminished because the glory of God is magnified, that should be joy to us. Sometimes, though, 
when the glory of God is magnified or the Lord wants to work a different way to bring himself glory and it puts us in another place, we have this attitude of depression. I've been shelved. I've been demoted. I've been put away somewhere. No. The Lord has something else for me to do now. He wants me to glorify him in another way. And he did so with John the Baptist, by the way. God wanted him to continue to glorify him in a different way. And it wasn't a positive way for John the Baptist either. He ended up beheaded. But notice what John the Baptist said in verse 30. He must increase and I must decrease. He must increase, I must decrease. That should be our focus and our motivation in serving the Lord. He must increase. Is that my motivation in Christ's service? He must increase. If it is, then I'm going to be able to have my joy fulfilled, like John the Baptist said, this, therefore, my joy is fulfilled. I'll be happy in Christ's service because I'm glorifying God. His glory is what I wanted in the first place. It was my motivation. So it's being accomplished. Amen. This is great. But if I have the attitude that I'm, uh, the focus is on me, I must increase and I don't care whether he decreases or increases, then my joy is not going to be fulfilled. And I'm going to be unhappy and unfulfilled in my service to the Lord Jesus. We have an attitude of pride that says, my way is the only way and my way is the best way. And don't try to tell me different. I'll be mad at you if you do so. You say, well, do Christian people act this way? Yes, we do. Yes, we absolutely do. And we might do, not do it for 10 years and then all of a sudden, boom, we, we're start, we fall into this trap. Or we might... Uh, uh, fall into it often and have to be bailed out of it. But God help us to be bailed out of it today for sure. We sometimes say, if I'm the only one, I won't be involved. If I'm the only one that has to do this, I don't want to do it. Remember Luke chapter 10? We have a little bit of time, so I'll turn to you there. Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, look at verse 38. <clears throat> Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And so Martha received the Lord Jesus into her house and Mary sat at his feet. And so this is the source of the trouble. Mary is the one receiving him into the house. Mary is the one doing a lot of the work and Mary is sitting at his feet. And that bothered Mary. But that was the Lord's will for Mary at that moment. And not the Lord's will for Martha. Look at verse 41. Jesus, uh, excuse me, verse 40. Martha was cumbered about much serving. She was bothered about much serving. And came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Don't we get this attitude? I'm the only one doing this. Nobody else is helping. I'm the only one doing this. Woe is me. I'm cumbered. And we start complaining. And Martha complained, and she complained to the Lord. She knew that he was the, the master. And so she said, don't you care? Don't you care that I'm the only one doing this? And the Lord said, Martha, Mary had a choice to make, and I wanted her to do one thing, and she could have chosen to do other, but she chose that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And he said, you're careful and troubled about many things. M Mary chose the one thing. See, this is what happens to us in our lives when we get focused on ourselves in surface and focused on our loneliness, our aloneness. I'm the only one in serving the Lord. We get careful and troubled about many things. That's what happened to Elijah. Remember, he said, I only am left alone and they seek my life. And God had to tell him, no, I have 7,000 who haven't yet bowed the knee to bow. What happened to Elijah? He started moping and he started getting anxious and he started on the run and he was afraid. This is what happened to Martha. He said, thou art careful and troubled about many things. You're worried, you've got anxiety in your life, and you're troubled, you're agitated, you're like boiling water, you're like something that isn't stable about many things. Because you have a bad attitude about one thing, it's affecting your whole life. And this is a pattern for you, Martha, and you need to make a change here. Mary hath chosen that good part. One thing is needful, which shall not be taken away from her. She became careful and troubled about many things because she had a bad attitude about her service for the Lord. She wasn't doing it for his glory. She was just doing it because she felt it needed to be done. And then she was unhappy because nobody else was helping her. She had her focus on herself instead of on the Lord Jesus. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Is my life built for the glory of God? By the way, I want you to notice also the strength of that motivation. It's a great motivation. S such a motivation. Often our motivation stops that commitment. I'm not going to commit to this because I know that's a great time commitment and I don't want to give up that time. That's my time. Of course, we have to have the right balance in these things with our family and all these things, but we should be willing to be committed to the Lord. Not say the time is my time, but it's his time. And how does he want me to use it is a better question. Often we'll commit, but then we stop at fulfillment. We say we'll do something and then we don't follow through. We don't accomplish that. We pass it off to somebody else or we don't follow through on that. And we say we're going to serve the Lord, but we don't do it. How many of you have ever made a New Year's resolution that you haven't kept? Okay. Every year. <laughs> make, some, make some New Year's resolutions that I don't keep. I'm, I'm, a, I'm great, on, great on saying, but not great on the doing. We've got to follow through with the doing for the Lord. That's the type of motivation that we need, a motivation that's so strong that it, it doesn't stop at just commitment. But it needs to be for the glory of God, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It is Christ's body, so it needs to go according to his order and be focused on him. Does he have the preeminence? Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 says, regarding Christ's body, that in all things he might have the preeminence. In all things. In our service for the Lord in Christ's body, he ought to have the preeminence. You heard that song in the chorus, For mercy is so great, what return can I make? For mercy is so constant and sure. I'll love him. I'll serve him with all that I have as long as my life shall endure. Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, speaking or service, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto God and the Father by him. There was a missionary to uh, Western India. His name was Henry Martin in the 1800s, and he was there with uh, William Carey for a time. But he had lived his young life as uh, trying to fulfill himself and to amass wealth to himself and climb the social ladder. And he got to a certain point where he said, this is worthless. And the Lord worked in his heart. And he wrote this. He said, I feel pressed in spirit to do something for God. I have hitherto lived to little purpose, more like a clod than a servant of God. Now let me burn out for God. And that was his motivation. I just want to be used by the Lord. I don't want to be a clod, a purposeless, useless clod. I, don't know, I want to be used for the Lord. Let me burn out for God. And so that lady, Bessie Hatcher, wrote that song, Let Me Burn Out For Thee, Dear Lord. You ever heard that song? It's a great song. The chorus says, Let me burn out for thee, dear Lord. Burn and wear out for thee. Don't let me rust, or my life be a failure, my God, to thee. Use me and all I have, dear Lord, and draw me so close to thee that I feel the throb of the great heart of God till my life burns out for thee. So we close, go over to Revelation 4, because I, I noticed that word that Peter used at the end of the passage, verse 11. He said, to whom be dominion forever and ever. Amen. In other words, this is the end of it. Amen. You could close this off. You could say, say that again. This is it. When it comes to our service to the Lord, our motivation is the paramount thing. Look at Revelation 4. Because when we come to the end of our lives and we stand before the Lord, this is what we're going to be doing. Revelation 4. He's there in the throne room of heaven. And you go to verse 8. The four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created." This is what we're going to be doing in eternity. We're going to be using our talents and using our beings to praise the Lord. Look at chapter 5, verse 12. 
saying, uh, 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 verse 11, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the numbers of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. It's a myriad of God's saints saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And this isn't these, aren't these the words of Handel's Messiah when you listen to that this year? Thou art worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and honor and glory and power and strength be unto him, verse 13, that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Let's get a head start on eternity now serving the Lord. Let our service to him be that which is for his glory. The motivation for our service has to be the glory of God and not our own glory. If it is, then we'll be like John the Baptist and our joy will be full. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your people and the responsiveness of their faces and then their hearts, Lord. I pray that you'd help us to grow in these areas of our lives and be totally committed to you. We thank you for providing us the means of service, giving us to these gifts and giving us the strength to fulfill them for you. And then also, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to have a motivation that honors you and that reveres you and that worships you and that lauds you in our lives and does not put ourselves to the forefront. We thank you, Lord, so much for your word. And we pray now that as we go, that you'll bless the time of eating and fellowship together. And we pray that you bless the food to our bodies and our time of fellowship. And we ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.